going. Welcome everybody to the second series of the GTM Talks, which is a webinar series that highlights some of the exciting research, monitoring, and stewardship efforts here at the GTM Research Reserve. Um, today's webinar will be recorded, so please keep that in mind. And after the recording has been processed, we will send this out um, and we will have the link available to the YouTube recording. Um, this webinar is a life of our rangers and it is the third within the series and it will focus on the GTM research reserves resource management teams day-to-day -day activities as well as some of the exciting monitoring efforts that they have going on right now um, before we get started just wanted to do a couple of virtual housekeeping reminders today um, on the screen, you should see your Zoom control bar where you are able to mute and unmute yourself. Um, for the time being, please keep yourselves muted so that way we prevent any background noise as our presenters um, share their slides and their presentation. Towards the end of the presentation today, we will have an opportunity where you can unmute yourself and ask any questions to our presenters. You are also welcome to turn your video cameras on. Um, just say hi and wave to us, but do not feel like you need to. And do keep in mind, if you do have your video on, that everyone can see what you're doing in your video um, screen. We will have the chat box open, so you are welcome to share any questions with our resource management team in that chat box throughout the presentation. Um, and we will answer those questions after their series of presentations today. Also, if you click on your participants tab, you can see everyone who's joined us today. And that's also where you should be able to raise your virtual hand, which will come in handy as we get closer to the Q&A portion. And we'll remind you of that when we get there. Um, so without further ado, I will go ahead and pass it off to one of our educators, Brittany, who will introduce our speakers today. Hi there, everyone. Um, I'm Brittany Wasik. I facilitate public outreach um, through the education department. And um, so I will introduce our uh, people that we have today. So we have all new employees, which is super exciting. Um, we will firstly have Laura Suthar, who joined the GTM resource management as the lead ranger for the Uplands management team. Um, she works with the public use and ecological monitoring portions, and she has previously worked as an OPS ranger at Talbot Island State Park, and most recently was teaching anatomy, chemistry, and biology at Creekside High School. Secondly, we will have Zach Lapura, and he is one of our newly welcomed Park Service Specialists. And um, he is a UNF graduate with a bachelor's in coastal environmental science. And he previously volunteered with research and um, stewardship before this position here at GTM and loves wildlife and biology, as I think all of us do too. Then we also thirdly have Sean Hatton and he is also presenting on, he is our newly hired invasive specialist here at GTM, and prior to joining the reserve, he interned um, as a keeper at the St. Augustine Alligator Farm, and he is a graduate of Flagler College. So today they have put together a presentation for all of us to find out what it's like to uh, in the day of the life of a ranger at GTM. And they're gonna give us also a little heads up on a new monitoring program, and um, so, We'll welcome Laura Suthar, Sean Hatton, and Zach Lapura. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen with you so you can see our PowerPoint. Hopefully.
Well, um, while, I, while I wait for my computer to catch up with me, um, I'm Laura Suzar. I am the new lead ranger at GTM. And um, before we get into the presentation, I'm kind of curious to know what you all think a ranger does on a regular basis. So a lot of what we do is in the public eye, but we also do a lot of things um, behind the scenes that people don't always see. So if you would share in the chat box um, something that you've seen the rangers doing at the reserve, something you think we do or know that we do, um, I'm just curious to know what your perspective is on uh, ranger work and what we do. All right. Well, Laura, while you work on getting the slides together, I'll read out what's coming in in the chat box. Um, so we have some folks who think that our resource management and ranger team maintains the trails and they save animals. I put in there that I think you guys pick up trash because I've seen that. Mm -hmm. um, we also see prescribed burns, managing and training turtle patrol. That's exciting. What else do you guys think that our ranger team does? Keeping the reserve beautiful, absolutely. Maintaining and patrolling the beaches at the GTM Research Reserve. I think I might have seen all of you guys do these things. <laughs> yeah, those are all things that we do. I just sometimes think when like we're driving out um, on the trails, like going out there on an ATV or a UTV and we pass by visitors, I wonder what they think like, oh, I wonder where they're going. I wonder what they're going to do out in the woods right now, you know? Awesome. So um, thank you, first of all, for inviting us to give this talk. We're really excited to share what we do in the resource management department. Uh, we've been asked to give a talk on a day in the life of a ranger, but really every day is unique as a ranger um, because we have so many different jobs to do and we have to address situations as they arise. So it's a very dynamic job. Um, no two days are the same. We're always working on something new and it changes seasonally and day to day as well. All right. So well, can you see the, the PowerPoint? You see the first slide? All right. Yeah. Some, it's not letting me switch slides. There we go. Okay. Um, so to simplify things, I've grouped all of our jobs into three categories of work. Um, there's grounds and facilities maintenance, which is uh, what someone said is basically keeping the park beautiful. Um, there's land management, which is how we um, keep the ecosystems healthy for all our native species. And then there's monitoring projects, which we use to um, monitor the health of our ecosystem and how it's adapting uh, to certain changes in the environment. So I will be speaking about grounds and facilities maintenance. Then I'll pass it over to Sean, our invasive specialist for land management. And Zach will tell us about all the monitoring projects. All right, and across all three categories of work, we always put safety first. Now, safety is our first priority. Um, a lot of the equipment that we're working with has the potential to cause bodily harm if not used properly. Um, and therefore, there's a lot of training and certification that goes into the job of a ranger. Um, certain types of work require us to get uh, training and certification before we can do it. Things like chainsaw work and prescribed fire uh, we always wear personal protective equipment that's appropriate to the job that we're doing. We safely operate our equipment and we're always on the lookout for potential hazards as well. So our goal is to maintain a safe park, a safe reserve for our staff and also for our visitors as well. So grounds and facilities maintenance uh, means maintaining safe and clean visitor use areas. And uh, most of the people here today probably are very familiar with the reserve and all the different visitor use areas. But if you're new to the area or you've just discovered the reserve, I'll go through and talk about all the areas that we have. Um, we maintain the beach parking lots along A1A. So the north parking lot, middle and south, and the boardwalks that go over the dunes. 
Uh, we also have the fishing area around the dam that separates Guana Lake from Guana River. Uh, we have our visitor center, which is closed right now uh, to the public due to COVID-19, um, but it's still there and we're still maintaining it. Um, and we have a ranger slash aquarist, Courtney, who's busy every day keeping all the fish and reptiles healthy and happy. So they will be healthy and happy when it opens up again. Um, we also maintain the trails, keep them safe and looking beautiful and the restrooms and picnic areas. So one topic that I wanted to kind of highlight today uh, while we're on the topic of maintenance is the problem of litter because I think that it's a bigger problem at the reserve than most people realize. Uh, most of you who are joining us today are probably the kind of people that would never intentionally leave trash on the ground. So you might not be aware of how common that is. Um, and just to give you an idea of how big the problem is, on average, we fill up about four five gallon buckets with trash every day. Um, so that's 20 gallons a day of litter. So this is just trash that we're picking up off the ground. I'm not talking about the trash that actually makes it into the trash cans. Um, and it takes us about two and a half hours split between the different rangers to collect all of that litter. So if we extrapolate that out to one year, that's 7,300 gallons of litter, which is about three full garbage trucks full of trash that if we didn't pick it up would end up just accumulating in the environment and causing lots of damage to the wildlife. Um, to do that, to collect all of that trash throughout the course of a year, it takes 912 hours of work. And so that's about one full-time ranger doing nothing but picking up litter for half the year. And as you'll see throughout the rest of the presentation, there are a lot of other things that we could be doing with that time if we didn't have to spend so much time collecting litter. So. Uh, sometimes at the dam when I'm down there picking up trash, people will joke around with me like, oh, they always keep you busy here, don't they? And, you know, I kind of laugh, but I want to say, actually, there's other things I would like to spend my time on. Um, because even though we pick up that litter, often the damage is already done, right? By the time we get to it to pick it up, um, it's been out in the environment and wildlife can encounter that. We recently had a juvenile night heron that died because it got some uh, crab line wrapped around its foot and it got stuck in a tree and it couldn't fly away. Um, and we've seen wood, uh, wood storks with monofilament line and weights hanging from their feet. Uh, so it really does a lot of damage, this trash in the environment. And it's something that I would really like to try and address. Um, so I figured since we're all here together, uh, we have many brains in one place. And if you have any ideas that you wanna share for ways that we could address the problem of litter at the reserve, I would be really glad to hear them if you wanna share them in the chat box. One thing I was thinking is that we could try to develop an interpretive program to give on site at the fishing area or at the parking lots near the beach. Um, it's, it's a difficult topic to uh, interpret to give a program on because you want to be honest about the dangers that this poses to wildlife, but you don't want to be gruesome, right, in presenting photos, especially to children of wildlife that have been harmed by this. So it's sort of a, a, a difficult topic to address, but I think it's really important and it's something that I, I would like to try and work on. So um, I'll move on. That's my little soapbox there about litter and tell you about all the other things we do. <laughs> so um, we also help to keep the park beautiful um, by mowing, weed eating, and landscaping all of our visitor use areas. So this is a really big job, um, especially in the summertime when things are growing so quickly, we have to mow very regularly. Um, and you know we mow all the parking lots, the visitor center, the dam. We have an office down in marine land that needs to be mowed. Um, so there's a lot of work that goes into that and then maintaining all of that equipment as well. 
Um, we also do landscaping around the visitor center. So we, we pull all the weeds in front of the visitor center where you have those nice um, native plants in the flower beds there. So we're working all the time to keep things beautiful. And in addition to mowing the trails, um, we also have to do other types of trail maintenance. We have to remove trees and branches that fall across the trails during storms. Um, and it's all about keeping the trails safe and accessible for our visitors. So when we see something um, that's blocking the trail, we try to get out there and remove it as soon as possible. Um, so this requires chainsaw work. And in order to do that, we need supervision from resource management staff who have the proper training and certification. There's a course called an S212 Wild, Wildland, Fire, Wildland Fire Chainsaws course. Um, so we have a few staff who have that certification and then they will train the rest of the rangers and supervise them um, as we remove those hazards. So there's, um, best practices for using chainsaws. There's a lot of personal protective equipment that goes into it. Um, and once again, safety is very important to us. All right, and there's many other things that we do just on a daily basis. Um, and so I just kind of put all the bullet points in here. We open and close the gates every day. We switch out the Iron Rangers, which are the locked boxes where people put their entry payments. We clean the bathrooms, empty trash cans. Uh, we maintain vehicles and equipment. We actually have um, a maintenance mechanic specialist ranger who helps to keep all of our vehicles running. We fill the trucks with gas. We fill gas canisters uh, to fuel all of our ATVs and UTVs. We construct and repair the boardwalks if they receive any damage during storms. And we communicate rules to visitors in a friendly manner. So really visitor interaction should be its own section um, because uh, that's a big part of ranger work. But for the most part, we're uh, giving general information about the park, answering questions that people have. And then sometimes we do have to remind them of the rules like keeping their dog on a leash. Um, and we always try to tell them the reason behind it. So keeping your dog on a leash is really about protecting the wildlife and protecting your dog as well. And with that, I will pass it on to Sean, who is our invasive specialist to tell us about land management. Hello there, everyone. Can you guys all hear me? Alrighty. Hi there, guys. My name is Sean. I am the invasive specialist here at the DCM Research Reserve. Um, as well as an OPS ranger, so I kind of do a lot of that lands management as well. Um, so start off, I guess we'll talk about the invasive plants that I deal with. Um, or if you could switch me on over. Okay, so I deal with three big things here as the invasive specialist. Um, first thing I'll go ahead and talk about is the invasive plants. So the job of an invasive specialist uh, requires that I be able to properly identify uh, invasive plants among numerous native plants, um, as well as achieve certification to utilize restricted use pesticides in natural areas. Um, some of the more common invasives that we deal with here at the NUR are going to be natal grass, lantana, um, and asparagus fern. Uh, these invasives are all important to manage for because if left unchecked or left alone, they will quickly move in and overtake land that was originally home to native plant species. Uh, moreover, uh, yeah. <laughs> More, moreover, they can replace native plants that our local wildlife critically depend on. Uh, usually the quickest way to remove an invasive plant is by manually pulling them up from the roots. Uh, sometimes this can get a little bit tricky. One of, our more, um, one of our more invasive plants that we have here is asparagus fern. And to be able to properly remove that, you need to get all of what are called tubers up out of the ground. If even one tuber is left in the ground, that plant can actually resurge with a vengeance, and I've seen it happen before. Um, in spots where we can't manually remove invasive plants, uh, we will also use what's called, we also use pesticides, um, which often involves being able to probably measure out and mix pesticides, utilize different methods of pesticide application, and to be aware of how to use these uh, pesticides um, to and be aware of how they affect the overall environment. More often than not, I find myself using the cut stop method for more of our stubborn invasive uh, trees and shrubs. 
This involves myself and another ranger going in and cutting the shrub very quickly and very quickly uh, applying the recommended herbicide uh, around the growing layer of the plant. Um, I'll discuss controlled burns also and prescribed fire a little bit later on in the presentation, but as it pertains to invasive controls, um, it can be effective as a control, but you also can open the way up. Um, burning can also, uh, yeah, sorry, invasive plants can also move into newly burned areas, uh, whereas previously they might have been um, held off by the dense foliage prior to the burn. Um, and so the second thing that I really involved myself here is the feral hog situation that we have at the GTM NERF. They're one of our probably most destructive terrestrial animals that we have here. Um, so often what I get asked most recently about feral hogs is what do they eat? And the better question to ask is what do they not eat? Um, feral hogs are what is known as opportunistic omnivores, meaning that they'll catch anything they really can get their uh, snouts on. <laughs> Um, so feral hogs have been known to eat a wide variety of plant life, insects, small crabs, and other crustaceans. Uh, some of the more detrimental food items on their, on their menu will be things like our gopher tortoise eggs, um, as well as if they make it on our beaches, they'll even go after our endangered sea turtles as well. Um, some of the environmental and uh, ecological impacts they can have on our reserve um, are things such as uh, in their search for food, Hogs will dig up and destroy hiking trails, farmlands, and even uh, private areas too. They can cause hundreds of dollars of damage this way. You might have been walking around on our trails and you might have seen some looks like we took shovels to it. That's all invasive hogs. Uh, they'll often root along the outside of trees in search of food, rub up against the sides of trees to uh, relieve themselves of things like parasites, like ticks or mosquitoes. Um, the boars, the big males, will do what's called tusking as well to sharpen their tusks in order to uh, battle for dominance. Um, and as you can imagine, this really does a number on the trees. Uh, and so this can result in the death of the tree if the damage is severe enough if they rip up all the bark, the protective layer of that tree. Um, feral hogs also displace our native wildlife. Uh, feral hogs compete directly with our native game animals such as deer and unfortunately, the size of our hogs, as well as the um, short amount of time it takes them to reach sexual maturity, often means that they'll over outcompete our native species. Um, in their rooting and wildling behavior as well, feral hogs create prime conditions for invasive plants to move in. Uh, to give you an idea, if a feral hog happens to run up, go up against a uh, tall grass plant and gets a bit of seeds on him, that feral hog is now going to carry those seeds wherever he goes ahead and wallows. And he's basically planting that seed when he wallows in that mud. So uh, just one invasive helping another invasive to hurt our, our environments. Uh, feral hogs also negatively impact water quality with the behavior called wallowing. Uh, feral hogs have no sweat glands, so to be able to cool themselves down, they will go ahead and wallow all up in the mud. They will uh, kind of dig in and just kind of hang out in that cooler water. Uh, so this obviously can release bacteria and other contaminants into our waterways. Uh, in certain cases the, where the wells are severe enough, uh, they can actually divert water flow and cause the drying up of a lot of our critically important freshwater habitats. Um, our control methods for our feral hogs uh, range between hunting and trapping. Um, our hunting regiments have successfully helped to remove now 24 feral hogs uh, from the start of this year. Um, and we are now entering into the fall season. We're expecting to remove even more. Uh, we have recently employed a variety of new tactics for our controls um, as well, uh, including scent control, automated food plots, and new more effective weaponry to be able to uh, dispatch these hogs in the most ethical man manner possible. Uh, currently, we're in the process of refining our trapping methods, including adding continuous entry gates to all of our traps, adding automated feeding equipment to train them on, regular, on a regular schedule, um, and also using game cameras to track the activity around our traps and around our hunting areas as well. So, um, and now additionally, a cool little thing that we've been looking at doing, uh, we're in the process of looking at getting a deep freezer to be able to preserve um, the hogs as well to be able to potentially donate them to the uh, local uh, zoos that can use the meat as also as well. <laughs> um, and then the last thing I do here also on the air is going to be the prescribed fires. 
Um, another big part of our responsibilities as lands management is the planning and implementation of prescribed fire. Uh, way back in the day, Florida, Florida practiced the policy of fire suppression. Many of us are old enough to remember the Smokey the Bear campaigns. Um, this is not conducive to a healthy environment, as, especially for Florida. Um, and I'll go ahead and discuss a little bit more in that. A lot of our, despite to say, just a lot of our native plant species and animal species rely on yearly prescribed, on yearly wildfires. Um, our pines, for example, need the presence of fire in order for their seeds to uh, take root and to flourish. Uh, gopher tortoises, as well as many of our other uh, species of reptiles and amphibians, need fire around their homes to prevent overabundance of vegetation from encroaching and pushing them out of their native habitats. Of their habitats. Uh, finally, though, perhaps most obviously, control burns are necessary to ensure that wildfires in Florida are not as destructive when they do occur. Florida is widely touted as the lightning capital of the United States, so wildfires are just going to happen, period. Uh, many of our native plants have adapted to this by actually becoming more susceptible to fire. Uh, to give you an example of that, perfectly green palmettos, like the kinds that you might see all along the roads here um, at GTM, will go up like newspaper. Um, they have a substance in their leaves that actually causes the palmettos to ignite so that the roots of the stalk and the leaves themselves will catch fire and burn out before that fire reaches the root system. Um, here at DTM, we have our entire property sectioned off into different burn zones that allow us to look at when the area was last burned and when, will it, when it will be due for another prescribed fire. Um, as of right now, we are in plans to burn our Pine Flats area, hopefully by the winter's end, uh, to restore much of the land that has become overgrown with things like needle grass and wax myrtle. Uh, rangers and other DEP employees must participate in some kind of wildlands fire training before being able to be on a control burn. I myself are S130, S190, and S131 uh, certified, um, which includes fire behavior and firefighting tactics. Uh, there's a lot that goes into a control burn, but it can be very easily summarized by saying, uh, by making sure that we make sure everyone is safe as possible on these burns. Uh, paying attention to changing fire and weather conditions and controlling where the fire spreads as much as we can so as to keep it within the area that we are trying to burn. Uh, we, use a lot of, we utilize a variety of equipment such as brush trucks with water tanks to, and fire hoses to protect structures and put out the uh, remnants of the fire after the burn. A variety of fire starting equipment but most often drip torches such as the one seen here in this picture um, that wides uh, and a wide assortment of hand tools to extinguish the fire as, uh, as we are ending it. Um, does anyone have any questions? No? If you guys have any questions for Laura or Sean, be sure to go ahead and type those into our chat box. And after the series of presentations, we will ask our resource management team. Ready. Well, I guess I'll go ahead and should I hand it on over to Zach then? Yeah, that Alrighty. would be great. Thanks so much, Sean. No problem. We got some good questions coming in for afterwards. <laughs> You hear me? Okay. We can. All right. um, I'm Zach. Um, I'm the Park Services Specialist here. And what I'm going to do is give a brief overview and the goals and procedures of each of the monitoring projects that the Rangers are, are involved with. I'm going to talk about the photo point monitoring, archaeological monitoring, um, marine turtle patrol, and our new reptile and amphibian, amphibian monitoring project. So first, uh, the photo point monitoring is led by Candace, who's our resource management coordinator. She does that within the freshwater marsh. The goals of the, of the project are to monitor water levels over time of the marsh and look at plant encroachment, 
from stuff like pines and wax myrtles and woody shrubs that'll draw water out of the marsh. The photos are taken from fixed posts. There's eight posts that um, give like a really good, they're taken from directions that give the best view of the marsh. And um, they're taken every three months to give an idea of how the marsh changes seasonally. They also provide a really good visual of our like physical restoration efforts, as well as the best times to do mechanical restoration work, like chopping vegetation. For example, you want to cut pines when they're still little saplings rather than let them grow and have to chainsaw. So in the future, we're hoping to restore the freshwater marsh by controlled burns and continue that photo point project to see how the water level and vegetation change after being burned. So next, I'm going to talk about the archaeological monitoring. There are 29 sites within GPTM NER that are home to archaeological artifacts and cultural resources. Those sites are monitored by Ranger Courtney and volunteers. Courtney um, underwent Heritage Monitoring Scout certification to be able to survey artifacts properly. They go out and survey one or two sites every single Friday. And each site is on about a six month rotation. So um, they're not monitoring every single one every week, but they get looked at once about every six months. And after any major storm event, like a hurricane, if it causes a bunch of erosion, they'll go monitor the coastal sites and see how they've been affected. So for procedures for each of those sites include reviewing the past finds, then they walk the perimeter of the site and then the like grid line pattern on the sites to visually scan for undocumented artifacts. If they find anything over 50 years old, they'll take photos of it and place a measurement card for scale on the photo and mark it with a GPS. And they never remove any artifacts from the site. Everything stays there. They'll just come back and monitor what they found. And uh, they submit all of that information to the Florida Public Archaeology Network, or FPAN. So now I'm going to talk about Marine Turtle Patrol. It's really majorly run by volunteers, really dedicated volunteers. But this season, the Rangers have been assisting the volunteers and learning how to do turtle patrol so we can substitute or help out when needed. The goals of the project are to collect long-term data on nesting behavior and gain a better idea on if our conservation efforts are working or to help determine if we need to put more efforts in place. We start patrols every single morning starting at sunrise and we scan the entire Guana North and South beaches on ATV for triple tracks during the nesting season. If we do find a trackway, we can identify the species by the track type and the trackway is determined to either be a nest or a false crawl. And if we do find a nest, the GPS location is marked and the mileage up the beach is marked and um, it's numbered and staked off, taped off, so we know where it is. About 92% of the nests on our beaches are from loggerhead sea turtles. So if we do find a loggerhead nest, we'll go ahead and dig to locate the egg clutch and remove one egg to be sent away for a genetics project. And part of what that project does is they can use the DNA to track the females, which is really cool. They'll um, see how many times that female nests over the year, how many nests she's made in one year, and where she's nesting. So after we mark the nests, they're checked daily for damage or predation. There's a lot of things that could predate a nest, like uh, fire ants, ghost crabs, or even coyotes, or unleashed dogs. And after about 45 days, we'll check them daily for an emergence, which is after about 45 days, the babies could start to hatch. And an emergence is just a little indentation in the sand where the babies are starting to hatch out. And three days after emergence, an emergence is observed, the nests are evaluated, which means we'll go in and dig to find the remnants of the clutch. And the remnants are sorted into three different, or not three different, a bunch of different categories. Uh, the empty shells, we'll sort those out, and those are successfully hatched babies. They'll either be live pipped or dead pipped, and pipped means the baby has started to exit the egg. They've broken out, but not quite made it totally out of the egg. Um, and the live pipped babies will kind of let them make their way out on their own and 
bring them to the water safely, make sure they get out there. Also, there's whole eggs, and those are usually unfertilized, whole eggs in the nest, and damaged eggs, which are usually infertile eggs that were somehow broken, either by the evaluator or babies making their way out of the nest. But yeah, any, any live hatchlings we find in the nests are released into the water. And all of that nesting and evaluation information is submitted to seaturtle.org. So now I'm gonna talk about our herpetofaunal monitoring project, which is the main project Laura and I have been working on for the past couple of months. It's a long-term monitoring project of all reptile and amphibian species within the uplands. And our goal is to collect an inventory of as many reptile and amphibian species as possible and use that inventory to update our species list, which I believe was last updated around 10 years ago. So we really wanna update that. And also use that information to calculate species richness and diversity, and also estimate the health of the habitats we're surveying in. Um, when our species list was last updated, they had about 49 species of reptile and 21 species of amphibian. So we're hoping to confirm that those are still in the park. The reason we chose to survey reptiles and amphibians was because they're a really good indicator of the health of an ecosystem. They sit somewhere in the middle of the food system, so they serve as predators and prey. And if their population is healthy, we can make estimates about the health of the population of their predators and prey. Also, amphibians are really sensitive to environmental change. They can respire through their skin, which makes them, for example, more susceptible to toxins than other species. So if we find few amphibians in aquatic environments where we would expect to find a lot, we can, we can kind of assume that the water quality is poor and sort of adjust our management for that. Um, they also live in a large range of habitats, aquatic, arboreal, which means in trees, and terrestrial. So by surveying as many different habitats as possible, we can use what we find as a tool for habitat management. For example, we are historically in the park, we had a um, populations of the federally listed striped newt. And in the past, the past couple surveys, yeah, here's a striped newt right here. The past couple surveys a few years ago failed to locate the newts. So that implies that the population has diminished. And um, if we fail to find the newts in our survey, we're gonna try to change our habitat management to make it more suitable for them. We can do that through mechanical treatment like mowing and chopping and controlled burns because the newts are dependent on burns as well. Um, we chose sampling methods that would capture as many different species as possible drift fence arrays with wire mesh traps for terrestrial species, PVC refugia for arboreal and neurons or tree frogs, and dip netting in bodies of water for the aquatic species, and uh, general site surveying as well. The parameters for site selection were um, we needed suitable habitat for the target species, of course, and then ideal space to install the drift fences. And there's a picture of a drift fence here. This is our one in the dunes. And um, also we needed zero visibility by the public because we don't want guests sort of interfering with our study. But um, yeah, we've placed the drift fence arrays in four habitats. There's beach dune, xeric oak hammock, inner dunal swale, which is the freshwater marsh, and xeric scrubby flatwoods. And the arrays are made up of three 7.6 meter long arms angled 120 degrees apart from each other. And each of those arms is gonna have four wire mesh funnel traps lining the arm. So um, we'll have a total of 48 funnel traps that very, very nice volunteers spent time helping us make. <laughs> yeah, here's, a, there, here's an example of the funnel trap on the right, and there's a pygmy rattlesnake inside of one, one of them. So the terrestrial species will be guided into the funnel traps. When they're traveling along, they'll sort of hit the fence and either make a left or a right and be guided into the traps. And um, survey periods will be two full weeks every season. So four times a year, we're gonna go out and survey for two weeks every single day, check the traps. So next, yeah, the PVC refugia clusters, which are just a group of three PVC pipes will be placed in 10 different sites around the reserve. 
to make suitable habitat for tree frogs. Um, each of the pipes is going to have a different diameter, one inch, an inch and a half, and two inches, just to accommodate our different sizes of tree frogs we have here. And uh, they'll be capped on the bottom to hold moisture because to make it more attractive for frogs to hide in. It's a really simple method, and uh, we don't have to check it every day, which is nice. We'll just every once in a while go out and see if any frogs are in our little pipes. And that's a really good way to find the frogs because they're somewhat elusive. Um, yeah, next, the dip netting. We're just going to use a standard dip net and seven bodies of water in the uplands, the freshwater ponds and stuff in the NUR. The target species will be aquatic like frogs, tadpoles, newts, sirens, and turtles. And lastly, we're going to conduct site surveys, which is basically just on the way to and from each site, we're going to look and anything we can positively identify will be counted. And that really helps with larger uh, reptiles and amphibians that can't really get into the traps or stuff that we can't catch in a net, like say a big snapping turtle or gopher tortoise or indigo snake, hopefully, but yeah. And by monitoring over a long period of time, we'll be able to observe trends in the herp population. And that'll allow us to document change from events like hurricanes or impacts from changing climate or more directly the elimination of our feral hogs like Sean's working on. And the data from each of the methods we have here is going to be collected by a Trimble device that Laura set up using the GIS software survey one, two, three. And that'll give each data point or each sighting a geographical data point that we can use to look for patterns across habitats and burn zones. So if you want to go to the next slide. So far, we have shadowed another researcher from FNA. And he's working on a very similar drift fence survey in the wildlife management area just north of us. And that gave us a lot of practice on identifying species and running through the survey procedure. But um, this striped newt pictured here is one that we found on his survey. So we're really hopeful to find them in our part of the park because they're so close by. So that gives us a lot of <laughs> enthusiasm. And yeah, our upcoming, upcoming projects. Starting in October, the rangers are going to start to assist with hawk watch, which is just the monitoring of migrating raptors. And we'll also begin water quality monitoring in the freshwater ponds and the marsh using the established hydro wells out there. Um, and possible future projects are additional photo points. We'd like to add some at our, our reptile and amphibian survey sites to monitor habitat change in the actual vicinity we're working in. And um, gopher tortoise burrow scope surveys. The actual burrows the gopher tortoises dig can be home to 360 other different species. And 567 burrows were discovered last year during the gopher tortoise survey. So we would like to conduct a survey focusing on the importance of gopher tortoise burrows as a refuge or habitat for other species in the NER. And lastly, um, shorebird monitoring, Ranger Alyssa would like to start that up again and work with Leah on monitoring shorebirds on our beaches. So that's all I had. Awesome. So as you can see, um, we are very busy here in the resource management department. Um, a lot of what we do on a daily basis is uh, those grounds and facilities maintenance activities, just keeping the park beautiful, safe, and accessible. Um, the land management that we do is mostly um, controlling for invasive species and hopefully implementing some more prescribed fire. Um, and then the monitoring projects allow us to assess the health of our ecosystems. Um, it also gives us the ability to evaluate how effective our management practices have been um, and adjust them as needed. And it also allows us to look for those long-term trends, right? Change over time, how well is this ecosystem adapting to changes like changing climate? So um, one difference between the resource management department, um, because I know at the GTM NER, there's a lot of different departments and it's a little hard to keep track of who's doing what. Um, but we are focused on the uplands, right? So if you think about the research uh, group or the stewardship team, they're more aquatic and estuary focused. 
and resource management is strictly uplands. So think about our trail system, uh, the dunes, the uh, maritime hammock in between the two. That's what we're managing on. And as you can see, there's a lot going on. There's never a dull moment as a ranger. It's a, it's a really exciting job and we all love it and we love to be here. All right. Thank you guys so much. This was really exciting to see everything that you guys do on a day-to-day -day basis, but also to see all of the amazing monitoring efforts that you guys have in place and are going to be working on in the future. Um, so thank you for a little insight into the field as we're all working from home right now. <laughs> Um, we do have some questions that have come in through the chat box. So we are going to ask you guys chat box questions first. Um, and then once we get through those questions, then we will turn it to the audience to do a live Q&A session. So Abby, I will let you go through our chat box questions. All right. Um, I also want to add that, yes, I am very jealous that you guys are on site and have been for the past several months because I uh, have been missing the reserve a lot. Um, but anyways, we had uh, several questions come in. Uh, I was really looking forward to today. Um, our first, uh, first question was, how many rangers are there? Okay, sorry, I have to like do some head math now. <laughs> um, so we have, we have Candace, our resource management coordinator. So um, she's in charge of everything in the resource management department. Um, and then we have John, who is our facilities maintenance specialist. Um, he's the one who can do all the things that um, most of us can't do, <laughs> like keeping those vehicles running. Um, we have uh, Alyssa who's a full-time ranger. We have Sean, our invasive specialist. Um, we have Zach, our park services specialist. And we have Ronnie, who is a part-time uh, OPS ranger. Oh, and then me. So that's seven, I think. Right? Did I miss anyone? I think there's seven of us. And Courtney. And Courtney, okay, yeah. Courtney is, um, so she's part-time ranger. Um, part-time aquarist, uh, which is really more than a full-time job. She's, she's such a hard worker. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, we definitely miss you guys, but you guys have the fun job and you're out, you're out in the field all the time. Yeah, I feel a little guilty. I feel like because we get to spend so much time outdoors that like the rangers are probably experiencing better mental health than most people during these times because we're not like cooped up. That's true. Um, our next question is, um, we, had a, uh, we had a question about when and where the next prescribed burn is going to be. Uh, should I take this one or do you want to take this one, Sean? Our, our plan is to do a burn um, hopefully this winter. Um, we're, we're hoping to do a burn sometime in December um, or January, depending on uh, when we can get the help. We need some outside help to do prescribed fire because um, the training that's required, the S-13190, everything is kind of on hold right now because of COVID. So normally we would have got all of our rangers um, through that training in preparation, but um, it's possible that we might not be able to do that until the spring or when courses open up. Um, but we can bring in some outside help and we're hoping to burn in the freshwater marsh um, this, this winter. Winter is typically the, the burn season, so that's our goal. Yeah, hopefully things will work out with that. Um, our next question is, uh, do we know how many feral hogs are in uh, reserve boundaries? I'll let Sean take that one. It's a lot. Um, it's kind of hard to get exact numbers on it, but from our game cameras, we can estimate probably well over 100. Um, I think the most we've caught on one game camera photo is 14 in one spot.
that's that's a lot <laughs> um all right um our next question is um do you guys use volunteers in your monitoring programs and uh, we have a few people uh, on the line today who are very interested in helping out yes this is a very timely question um so we just uh sent out the information to shannon reidinger who's our volunteer coordinator um, letting her know uh, that we would need some volunteers for the reptile and amphibian monitoring project so that's coming up uh, starting on October 7th through the 21st. Um, I think that she posted a couple of dates for that um, and they filled up, but um, we're actually gonna open it up and have ideally one volunteer every day for that whole two week period. Um, so there should be some opportunity there if you're interested in joining us, just keep in mind that um, doing this type of work because we had to construct all of our drift fences pretty well off the trails. Um, it's very rugged. So, you know, you're going to be going through very uneven terrain. Um, you're probably going to end up with some ticks on your clothes. Um, you're going to want to bring water and, and dress appropriately. And it's, it's not, you know, office work. It's, it's really out, the, out in the field getting dirty. So be prepared for that. But we are really excited and we'd love to have your help. But that's the fun part <laughs> about being in the field. Um, our next question is, how has COVID impacted your guys' ability to do your jobs, would you say? Do you, want, do you guys want me to answer that or do you want to jump in? I don't want to hog all the questions. Um, I think in, it's, it's difficult for me to say because I've only worked in COVID times here. Um, I, I wasn't at the reserve pre-COVID, so all that I know is like the after times. Um, but it, one impact is that when we're in the office, as you can see, um, Zach and Sean are wearing their masks. So anytime that we're in an indoor space, we're wearing our masks. Um, there's a lot of new cleaning regimens that are going on in the building to make sure that all the surfaces are sanitized on a regular basis. Um, I mean, I would say that probably the other departments like education have been impacted more because um, it just limits the amount of like visitor activities that we can do at the reserve. Um, but regular maintenance activities are still happening um, all the time. So uh, we're still out there managing for that. Um, yeah, I think I I'm just glad that we're able to provide this space for people to be outdoors during this time. Can I say something real quick? Mm -hmm. um, the, I think the biggest thing is just the certifications, like the burn certifications that's been put on hold from mm -hmm. COVID. But other than that, and the transportation around the vehicles, we can't ride together, but right. that's all that's affected. We're Sean, probably says, <laughs> Sean says we miss everyone too. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> we miss the people that we, I, there's a lot of people that um, I work with, we're all part of the same organization and I've never met them in person before, only through like Zoom or Teams, yeah. Yeah, I see a comment from Ranger Alyssa. She said, it's a little different, but beyond the times we were shut down, I don't think it's really prevented any work, but you guys have accomplished so much in the past couple, several months. And I'm excited. I think we're all excited to get back whenever we can and see all the hard work that you guys have done. Um, the only other question I see um, uh, it was a question about prescribed burning. Um, do you prefer to burn in the summer, which mimics nature, or do you have to burn in the winter for other reasons like safety or training or staffing? I think the main limitation um, on our ability to burn is, is training right now because we haven't been able to get those trainings. Um, I think that typically we will burn in the winter when things are, are dry enough to hold fire. Um, but 
I think in the WMA, they burn, they burn almost year round. Um, it's just that in the summertime, there's a, there's a lot of other things that we have to do um, because there's more visitor activity, there's more mowing that's going on. So we're kind of stretched a little bit thin in the summertime. Um, and in the wintertime, we, we have a little bit more opportunity to work on the, the land management side of things. What, do you guys agree? Anything to add? So I've been on uh, both winter and summer burns. Um, in the winter, the burns are, they're a bit more controlled, um, you know, but in the summer, I mean, everything's gonna be hotter. We're getting the impacts in the sun also. So fires burn larger and typically faster. So mm -hmm. that's one upside. Um, you do have issues with things like wind also in the summer too. Like we get a big windstorm or the gust from a oncoming rainstorm uh, that can impact fire. So it's it's probably more controlled in the winter is the best way to say it, um, but not as fast and effective. So it it depends. It really does depend. Um, and for uh, folks that don't know quite where the freshwater marsh is, just in layman's terms, um, it's kind of the area if you're walking on Yellow Trail and you look to the right, um, it's that kind of um, area there. Awesome. Well, it does look like those are all of our questions from our chat box, and we are almost to the end of our time with everybody today. Um, so what we'll do is if there are any questions that you guys still have, if you want to add them to the chat box while you can. Um, and uh, if anybody is still dying to ask their question live to our rangers, um, we'll stick around for a couple minutes afterwards. Um, but I do want to go ahead and say thank you to all of you for attending today. Um, it really means a lot that everybody tunes in to hear more about what's happening at the reserve. And thank you to all of our wonderful presenters, Laura, Zach, and Sean. It was great to have you guys be a part of our GTM Talks series and to hear about all of the wonderful things that you guys have going on. I am going to launch a quick poll just to get some feedback from everybody. That should have just popped up on your computer screen. Just let us know how you enjoyed today, what you thought about it. And I wanted to remind everybody that we do have another GTM Talks on Monday, October 12th at 3 o'clock p.m. And it will be uh, delivered by the Friends of the GTM Reserve and our Education Coordinator. And they'll be sharing about our process and learning more about the Gullah Geechee at Guana. And it'll give an introduction to the Gullah Geechee heritage and highlight some of the Friends of the GTM Research Reserve efforts in interpreting the story of the Gullah Geechee people on the Guana Peninsula. So it'll be a really great opportunity to learn more about our cultural resources. Um, and we'll send out the registration link in an email. And we will also post the registration link on the Friends of the GTM Reserve website. Um, this webinar is was recorded and we will also send that link out in an email to you guys afterwards. So keep an eye on whatever email address you registered with today and that's where everything will go. Thank you all for joining and you are welcome to leave but you are also welcome to stay and chat with anybody for as long as they're willing to chat with us. <laughs>